you I just wanted to talk briefly about um, uh, the base, the anti-base movement in Okinawa, some of the history of our, uh, like, or excuse me, uh, U.S. presence there and meddling and, and the complications of what has essentially been like 150 years of, of neo-colonialism or straight up colonialism happening there. Um, so let me see if, there we go. So just to start off, uh, Okinawa is the largest island of the Okinawa and, and Ryukyu island chains at, at the southwestern extremity of modern Japan. It's the smallest and least populated of the five main islands of Japan, uh, home to about 1.5 million people. Uh, but it's proportionally home to the largest U.S. military presence, uh, the most recent in a long line of foreign occupiers. Uh, Okinawa has been a de facto and a de jure colony of the U.S. for approximately 150 years. Um, Okinawa houses about three-fourths of the U.S. military facilities and two-thirds of the American troops in Japan. Uh, roughly 10% of the population is American military and their, and their uh, dependents. Uh, there are 50,000 military personnel in Okinawa with 40,000 dependents and 5,000 civilian contractors, though those numbers are a little old. They might have gone up. Um, so, And U.S. bases take up roughly 20% of Okinawa's land mass uh, with more in their air and sea activities. Um, and in an irony that would likely infuriate him, uh, one of the bases bears the name of the anti-war activist and the most decorated uh, U.S. veteran of all time, Smedley Butler, <laughs> which I thought was funny. Uh, sad, depressing, but funny. Um, and military bases count for about 5% of the island's economy, but they may kind of have a more domineering influence as they, in fact, drive away tourism and other industry. Um, and until 1972, the U.S. formally controlled Okinawa, as it did all of Japan, um, until 1953 in the occupation following World War II. Uh, and Okinawa was a holdover, and it's historically been contested territory. Um, so one of the many consequences of the U.S. occupation of Japan was its formalization and institutionalization of Japanese rule in Okinawa, which uh, was at that point fairly recent and had been strongly resisted by Native uh, Okinawans ever since. Um, uh, in fact, uh, the U.S. has leveraged this anti-Japanese sentiment as propaganda for their military presence. Um, so there's campaigns stressing American and Ryukyuan friendship and cooperation under the guise of this shared anti-colonialism, uh, but it fell on deaf ears. Uh, and it kind of reminds me how in the Indonesia series, if you've watched it, uh, that we did here on the channel, um, we talked about like the U.S. supporting the Papuan independence movement in Indonesia in order to seize their natural resources and bolster efforts for regime change in, in, in wider Indonesia. So that's like liberatory language of, of peace and self-determination is, is twisted to support like this neo-colonial agenda. Um, but though today it's considered a part of Japan, Okinawa and the Ryukyu people have a long and storied history distinct from Japan and their Chinese neighbors. Um, so the cultures of all three places have overlapped and clashed over centuries with the Ryukyuans never having full sovereignty, even though they were like recognized as a distinct people and a distinct culture. Um, Okinawa also has its own language, um, Uchinaguchi, which is spoken mostly by elders and ethnic Ryukyus. Um, and like uh, Gaelic, it's kind of dying out and consciously being erased by like education curriculums, things like that. Um, but in the 14th century, Okinawa was ruled by three principalities or three mountains, um, Hokusan, Chuzan, and Nansan. Um, and it was close to the Chinese mainland. So it was a site of cultural and economic exchange and eventually became a tributary of the Ming dynasty. Uh, later in 1690, it fell to the control of the Tokugawa shogunate after a brief invasion. And for a time, the kingdom was under the dual subjugation of Chinese and Japanese occupiers during the Meiji period. Um, and under Meiji rule, the native Okinawan ethnicity, language, and culture was heavily suppressed and ethnic Japanese migrated there in mass under a campaign of assimilation. Um, and I thought this was interesting, but that on average, ethnic Okinawans have a markedly longer lifespan than their Japanese counterparts with five times as many Okinawans reaching past the age of 100. Um, and I, I guess this longevity might be aided by kind of a simple lifestyle and connection with the vast natural beauty of the area. I don't know. At Okinawa is home to some of the most pristine, like 
wildlife and, and marine life in, in the world. And that's part of the reason why these bases are, are so destructive. Um, but it, uh, the Ryukyuan kingdom also had a monarchy, obviously, but the last king of Ryukyu was forced to abdicate after being annexed by Japan and relocated to Tokyo. And then the Ryukyuan royal family was kind of like incorporated into the Japanese royal family. Um, and to this day is still kind of hanging out there. Um, and then under the Meiji government, finally, the Ryukyuan kingdom was incorporated as, into Japan as the Okinawa prefecture in 1879. And the neighboring island group became a Kagoshima prefecture. Um, so, and that's uh, one of, that's just a picture of a protest happening on base. Um, so now that brings us to uh, what Zenko and the DSA are trying to do. Um, and I'll, I'll link uh, information about all of this as I go. Um, but speaking to things we've been talking about in the chat, uh, as Americans, I feel we have a unique responsibility to lend solidarity to Japanese anti-base and anti-imperialist movements and environmentalist movements, anti-nuclear movements, because the U.S. transformed Japan into a puppet state following its seven-year occupation at the end of World War II, literally rewriting Japan's constitution to allow for the unmitigated expansion of U.S. military presence, um, which remains unchallenged to this day. Uh, Article 9 of the Japanese peace constitution states that the Japanese people forever renounce war as a sovereign right of the nation, and that land, sea, and air forces, as well as other war potential, will never be maintained. Um, but since the end of World War II, the U.S. has pressured Japan to revoke this Article 9 and play a greater role against what was the Sino-Soviet bloc and is now just the PRC in, in modern-day Russia, right? Um, and U.S. bases have been routinely cited as violations of Article 9 with people like Douglas MacArthur intervening um, to kind of protect uh, the, the right of those bases to exist, uh, and pulling the strings with ambassadors, things like that. He was the uncle of the U.S. ambassador to Japan um, the last one of the last times this was like formally brought up in court. Um, but in between the U.S. occupation of Japan and its return and the return of Okinawa to Japan in 1972, because uh, it happened at different times. Neither the U.S. or the Japanese Constitution applied, so there was this legal void that allowed for continued uh, expansion and violation of uh, the rights of local people. Um, and the occupation government actually required Okinawans to obtain a U.S.-issued travel pass to visit Japan and control the movement of Japanese visitors to Okinawa. Uh, by the mid-1950s, the military had seized more than 40% of Okinawa's farmland and displaced a similar proportion of its people. Uh, a Navy officer would later say to high-ranking Pentagon official Morton Halperin, the military doesn't have bases in Okinawa. The island itself is the base. Um, and in Japan, this occupying military infrastructure has gone largely unchanged since the end of World War II. Uh, as of 2010, the United States still has 124 bases in Japan, 38 of which were in Okinawa alone. Uh, South Korea still has 87. Um, in 2012, uh, my friend David Vine confirmed that the total number of U.S. bases, despite the closure of around 500 bases in Iraq, was still more than 1,000, and the annual cost of maintaining that global network of bases and approximately a quarter million overseas troops was around $250 billion. That number has definitely gone up in the last decades. And China, our contemporary rival, has zero overseas bases, I believe. They might have one now in Africa, I forget. They have a handful of ports that people like to get mad at, like their military installations, they're not. Um, but before I continue, let me post the sign up link for this conference. It's on Saturday the 19th uh, at eight. So might not be a great time uh, for everybody, but I think the international- Is that the first one? Uh, What's that? Campaign to stop Pinoco together with DSA members. Oh, you got it. Never yeah, mind. it's okay. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to make sure I sent the right links because I don't know what the fuck I put in our document. Um, yeah, China might, but and and I think Russia has like four or five bases outside their borders and in the Middle East that have since been closed. Um, but anyway, so, uh, and then, okay, let me continue back here. Okay, so. Uh, what is Zenko about? Uh, what do they have to say about some of this? So Zenko is, uh, it's a Japanese acronym for, but it stands for the National Assembly for Peace and Democracy. They are founded in 1970. Um, and they talked about how they oppose these neoliberal policies of 
global capitalism through their work doing anti-base activism for labor rights, anti-nuclear and environmental activism, childcare, workers co-ops, etc. And they've also sent six members to local assembly in Japan, which is pretty cool. Um, and so this campaign specifically to stop the Hinoko base is called ZAP or Z-H-A-P. Um, it's the Hinoko anti-base project that started in 2021. Um, but, uh, or I guess that's what this new campaign is called, but they've been resisting the base ever since it began construction 20 years ago. Um, so construction began uh, despite overwhelming resistance to the base construction and local government uh, complaints. Um, but this Hinoko base is uh, going to replace, oh, let me see if I have a picture on the next slide here. Yeah. So this Hinoko base is uh, designed to replace uh, Futenma, which is the World War II era base that's really dangerous and shitty that has existed there since uh, the war. Um, and there's, you know, 30 five to 40 bases, I'm not sure of the exact number today, occupying, you know, like 20% of the land, they already bear an excessive burden of the US military presence in Japan, and they bring noise, crime, aircraft accidents, toxic leaks, like what we saw at the Red Hill facility in Hawaii, uh, right? Um, hopefully, I have time to explain that. But a lot of the crux of like the island hopping strategy and the stay behind kind of network of Pacific bases has a lot to do with the presence of oil, the protection of the flow of oil um, and keeping our military fueled as a standby force pretty much anywhere in the world. Uh, but I'll get to that. Um, Okinawans have repeatedly shown their opposition for the Futenma base um, and the planned Hinoko base with a referendum in which 72% of residents said no. Uh, yet Washington and Tokyo continue to ignore them. And then there's this question of the validity of these bases by, you know, government invitation, which a lot of hawks like to bring, bring up, right? Like, oh, it's it's on paper that they're allowed to be there. It has the support of the government, but does the government represent the will of the people in this regard or in any regard? Not really. Um, but like I mentioned before, the U.S. literally unilaterally rewrote Japan's constitution to allow for this type of shit. Um, and the Japanese government has been accelerating U.S. military expansion willfully, um, as well as its own hopes for rearmament since the 1950s to massive public backlash, um, which seems to factor not at all into matters like this. Um, and so it's... Okinawa specifically is important because it's a part of this like larger Indo-Pacific strategy that kind of emerged after the end of the Cold War, right? I forget, there's like a term, it's like four, or it's like a cube or something to describe like uh, Russia, China, Japan, and DPRK or something, and Hillary Clinton talks about it. But um, basically, it's kind of the crux of our like new Cold War strategy and like our lily pad island hopping base strategy as opposed to like these massive uh, fortresses and enclaves that are kind of relics of the Cold War era. Um, so in order to stop this base means to stop this new grand design for US strategy in Southeast Asia and beyond and, you know, the new Cold War that's currently underway. Um, and indeed, the, the bases in Okinawa were part of our original Cold War hubs targeting China and the USSR, from which a majority of Soviet oil refining capacity could be neutralized. Um, that was a ma major part of the strategy for, for finding the location of each base was how hard can we hit the Soviets and how quickly. Um, and then obviously later it was a major hub of operations during the Vietnam War. Um, and so, and these bases in Okinawa and Guam house nuclear warheads that serve as our first line of offense, I would say, for a nuclear strike uh, in Asia, in Eurasia. Um, and it's also recently been discovered that during the Cuban Missile Crisis on Okinawa, uh, a large force of MACE missiles with a 1.1 megaton uh, nuclear warhead uh, and F-100 fighter bombers armed with H-bombs uh, were preparing for action. And their likely target was not the Soviet Union, but China. Uh, because if you know about uh, U.S. Uh, nuclear strategy, the very first PSYOP plan, Single Integrated Operational Plan for Nuclear War, which was approved by Eisenhower in 1961, called for a joint strike on the USSR and the PRC with the goal of total annihilation. Uh, they, the two have always been lumped together and that you know speaks to how strong of an alliance they still have. 
Um, but the estimated deaths from this PSYOP plan in Eurasia alone were about 400 million people. Uh, and everyone in the room, including Eisenhower, concluded that this was reasonable uh, and approved it. And so our PSYOP plans, even though whichever PSYOP 500 we're on now is, is classified, uh, you have to imagine that there's death of that, that scale uh, and scope that is uh, sanctioned in these types of plans. Um, and the area surrounding this base, as you can see, is pristine protected ocean. It's actually designated as a hope spot that harbors some of the highest marine biodiversity in the world. Um, and there is a super soft seabed found on the site of the base, which I don't know if that means there's like a risk of sinking or what. Um, but more importantly, two fault lines run directly underneath the base. Um, in between the fault lines is a powder magazine that is suspected to house nuclear warheads. So they're literally, they literally stuck nukes in between, not like tectonic plates, but you know what I'm saying. Shit's moving around in there. That's actually a huge problem with like nuclear waste storage in general, but I digress. Um, and another issue is that the earth and sand that are to be dug for the land reclamation likely contains human remains from the Battle of Okinawa, otherwise known as Operation Iceberg, from April to June of 1945, which was the single bloodiest land battle in the Pacific theater. Um, anywhere between 100,000 and 140,000 Okinawans, um, up to a third of the pre-war population, uh, died in the U.S. invasion of the island. Uh, most were civilians, and many died by suicide um, because they just were so afraid of the carnage that was unfolding before them. And also, 13,000 American soldiers were killed, about 36,000 wounded, roughly. And there are 228 soldiers that U.S. soldiers that were marked as missing in action after the Battle of Okinawa, whose remains uh, uh, experts believe are, are likely underneath this base and are, are being disturbed as well by all this construction. Um, and, you know, we claim to care a lot about bringing our boys home, but, you know, we're happy to build right on top of them and not let them, not let anyone rest uh, dead or alive. But so the massive losses at the Battle of Okinawa were a major influence actually in the decision to drop the atomic bombs. Uh, right, the casualties were so massive that leaders were con thought that the bombs might be a, a way to avert that kind of uh, destruction. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but you guys know how I feel about that. But anyways, and also like, yeah, Japan is obviously part of the U.S. nuclear umbrella, um, along with South Korea, and it's our main. Japan is our main like nuclear hub in Southeast Asia. The other being Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean, home of the Chagossian people, and uh, Australia, now with this AUKUS thing. Um, but budget and timeline have gone vastly over predictions for this new base, so there's no clear estimate of when it will be done and at what cost. Um, meanwhile, the Marine Corps has been considering moving its base of operations to Guam. Um, so Zap, uh, Zenko and their Zap campaign seeks international support to stop the base. Um, so before I move on, I'm going to link uh, they have a change.org petition going, and there's this really handy website that lets you contact your local represent. Oh, thanks for the hype train, by the way. That's cool. Feel free to cut me off if something like that happens. Um, but uh, there's this website that will, all you have to do is enter your name and, and where you're at. You don't even have to be a U.S. resident, but it will connect you with your local representative or a representative with the script. All you have to do is press send and it'll yell at them to try to uh, get them to stop this base. Um, but not only is the Hinoko base a hub of empire and environmental damage, uh, it is also a hub of crime that affects the local population with little to no accountability. And this has been documented across Japan uh, with our military bases, but especially in Okinawa. Let me see if the next slide has anything about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so in 1995, three American servicemen, some of you might know about this, this is really famous. Three American servicemen based out of Camp Hansen in Okinawa kidnapped, bound, oh, it's, trigger warning, this is really upsetting. Uh, kidnapped, bound, and raped a 12-year-old Okinawan girl, uh, which caused an international uproar. And the incident brought to light, uh, as I mentioned, the kind of extraterritoriality clauses in the US-Japan status of force agreement, which is like, the legal framework that we're, we operate on uh, in Japan, the military does. Um, it partially exempts US troops from prosecution under Japanese law, right? So there were fears that these guys were gonna get away with it or not be 
uh, tried it all or given a slap on the wrist and court-martialed, whatever. Um, but the three soldiers were tried and convicted under Japanese law, and they were given less than the recommended 10-year sentence. They served seven years each. Uh, and ironically enough, they complained about inhumane conditions in Japanese prisons amounting to slave labor and how they had to make shit, uh, their manufacture shit. Spoiler alert, that happens here too. But uh, and then, uh, but at least 350 crimes have been documented by one uh, anti-base organization against Okinawan people by U.S. service members since 1945, with the actual number likely being much higher because uh, another organization uh, cited that between January 2015 and December 2020, only in a span of only five years, 69 Marines were convicted in Okinawa for sexual offenses involving minors including possession and distribution of child sexual abuse images and actual or attempted sexual assault of children. So, By the way, that follows every military base. Yeah, every every single base. And we are operating anywhere between 800 to 1,000 bases in 100 countries around the world. So literally pick any base and shit like this happens there. Um, and it rarely, if ever, gets talked about. And because of the legal infrastructure, uh, the the perpetrators are rarely held to account. Uh, so, uh, do, 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 let me scroll down here. And additionally, uh, you know, the U S military presence has acted as a super spreader of COVID and its variants, uh, disrupting otherwise competent local pandemic safety measures, right? U S troops are not beholden to Japan's COVID restrictions. And so they spread it to vulnerable, pop vulnerable populations freely, including, uh, the recent outbreak of Omicron in Japan was actually traced back to U.S. troops. And uh, wasn't wasn't that also like how the Spanish flu got to Spain was from American soldiers traveling there? I, I actually I don't that. know about that. I'd be interested I, if anybody have, in the now, chat now that knows I said that. that. I have to Google it, but yeah. Um, but let me I, I'm going to gloss over this because I was going to talk a lot about like the origins of like our naval empire and like gunboat diplomacy and like the ideology behind that. But uh, uh, research got in the way. But uh, what I want to drive home is that like before World War II, the guy on the left, uh, Alfred uh, Admiral Mahan, uh, was kind of like the, the father of this uh, notion of like a, a global like naval empire. And uh, in, in the turn of the 19th to 20th century, like really championed like the, the Navy as like the, the top of our military pyramid, uh, right? Because they, navies exist, uh, spoiler alert, navies exist to protect markets, right? They're to protect the flow of, of commerce, of, of trade and, and commerce, right? Yeah. They, they don't, but, we don't have a Navy because there's fucking Nessies and we're killing Kaijus out in the ocean, although that'd be yeah. kind of cool, but. Just to, but, just to uh, like highlight this, uh, the Spanish flu from Whip White, more American soldiers died from the Spanish flu during World War One than died yeah. in combat. Yep. Yep. By the way, this is why Hawaii is such an important base for the U.S. Yeah. Uh, it's it's like a global choke point of of goods. Yep. And why uh, it's why we want to the the Red Hill uh, leak went unaddressed for so long. It's because we need all that oil. We don't care if it leaks out into the water because that oil needs to be there in order to jettison people across the ocean uh, more quickly and more efficiently. Right. Um, as well as like, you know, extract all the local resources. And they've there. probably already budgeted some amount of waste oil into the ocean where it's like, well, we we can afford yeah. to lose that much oil. Yeah. No, it, it wasn't until it started affecting their own service members to the point where people were literally hospitalized that they were like, oh, OK, maybe yeah, we have to do even then it was this. only after it became a critical mass of their own service members that it like their service. Me they couldn't keep that quiet. Yeah, yeah. And I think as far as Red Hill, they're in the process of like drafting a new design plan or so, you know, like they're arguing about that, but they're not really, uh, they might, there is a deadline and might have already passed to like agree to adopt the local government's like me safety measures. Um, but they cannot, they can always push back, right? They can fight this for as long as they want. So um, if they, if they do end up, uh, conceding here it's not out of the goodness of the of their own hearts or anything right um but japan uh before world war ii u.s troops being permanently stationed overseas was unheard of and i've talked a lot about world war ii specifically sparking a conversation about u.s militarism and isolationism and our place in in the modern world uh at home and abroad right what kind of empire would we be should we be an empire uh, are we an empire 
Um, and by 1945, we, we definitely already were, right? We have the Philippines, um, other different places. But um, Japan and specifically Okinawa were home to some of the earliest US enclaves abroad or overseas rather, forming the skeleton of our future global empire. Uh, as with most of our bases, uh, these positions were secured through illegal, questionable means. Uh, most people cite the Spanish-American War as the beginning of our overseas empire, but it, it's actually a half century prior that it kind of begins. Um, with, in 1853, uh, Navy Commodore Matthew Perry paid $50 for a plot of land on what is now called Chichijima, near Iwo Jima in the Western Pacific. He wanted the island to become a coaling station, right? We talked about the importance of oil before oil. Our, our steamboats and, and warships were powered by coal uh, for steam-powered military operations. Um, and our so our base nation of empires was formed specifically with with energy in mind. Um, and uh, this guy, Matthew Perry, also created the first military base in the kingdom of Okinawa, or the, excuse me, the kingdom of Ryukyu, uh, almost 100 years before our uh, World War II bases would be established there. Um, and though uh, Perry's base only lasted about a year, he used it to create uh, further U.S. enclaves in Japan and un impose unequal treaties on both Okinawa and Japan, opening up uh, Japan to U.S. slash European powers for the first time in a lot of places. Because a lot of people don't know that the atomic bombing of Nagasaki was uh, significant because uh, Nagasaki was Japan's only international port for centuries. Um, and that's why it's also one of the largest Christian strongholds in Southeast Asia, right? But for a very long time, Japan was totally isolated with trade from the rest of the world, aside from at Nagasaki uh, specifically. Um, but I digress. Uh, so this Mahan guy was a naval historian, uh, president of the Naval War College, and he studied these different empires of history, the Roman Empire, the British Empire, etc., to figure out how the US could be dominant in the 20th century and how we can make this the American century. And so he came up with this trifecta of foreign markets, naval power, and US bases as a means for us to establish global preeminence. Um, and he said that if navies exist for the protection of commerce, then in war they must aim to deprive their enemy of that resource. Protection and maintenance of trade is the chief aim of any navy, more important than any other strategic, strategic task which helps us explain why the US Pacific fleet on its own is the largest Navy in the world. Uh, and, and obviously that means our Navy, but it's not, though a lot of countries have navies in some capacity, most countries don't have blue water navies and blue water navies are what we call like globally operating or, or navies with the capability to operate globally. Um, not a ton of countries have that. Um, but he's saying the quiet part loud, right? Uh, like that navies exist first and foremost to protect the flow of capital, like not any sort of national security interest, but the flow of capital is, is a national security interest in, so far as we're concerned, right? Um, but as we've seen kind of with how average Americans are treating the gas crisis with regards to Ukraine, most people kind of understand that but they just don't understand that that's bad. <laughs> uh, but anyways, uh, and there's MacArthur, right? He had a large part in, in uh, keep, keeping Okinawa uh, under US jurisdiction and he fought really hard to keep it that way. This is a stamp of that Perry guide, a commemorative, uh, Japanese commemorative stamp uh, from when he invaded <laughs> Okinawa, uh, which I don't know, I'd love to have that stamp. I wonder how much that went for. Uh, but it was MacArthur who came up with this idea of the island hopping strategy. MacArthur is the supreme commander of uh, the allies in the Pacific, obviously. Um, but he used this Mahan doctrine that islands will win the war and control the peace um, to, as, as, a, as a means of building. Uh, the Navy alone built almost 200 bases, 195 bases in and around the Pacific during the war, uh, 288 in the Atlantic Ocean and 11 in the Indian Ocean. Um, and so MacArthur kind of hatched this offshore island perimeter strategy using the Pacific islands to create uh, essentially like a giant moat between Southeast Asia and the mainland US with Pacific islands and their bases as the wall. Um, and you've seen this like uh, empires and, uh, you know, nations throughout history have kind of understood the importance of, of this line specifically. And then the second line, I don't know if you can see my mouse of like the, these barrier islands, right? Um, 
So it begins in the Philippines and it kind of goes up through the Ryukyu Archipelago, which is over here. Um, and then, you know, Okinawa is in there and then it ba bends back through Japan, um, Vladivostok, uh, and then the Aleutian uh, Islands, island chain. Um, so the U.S., oh, excuse me, the U.S. insisted on complete sovereignty over the captured Pacific Islands after World War II. Um, and uh, they often pushed for full annexation and considered, and also were considering how to incorporate uh, these Pacific Islands into the state of Hawaii somehow. Um, and at the same time that Britain and France were facing global pressure to decolonialize and surrender their colonial holdings in line with like the Atlantic Charter and the UN Declaration of, uh, Universal Decla Declaration of Human Rights, the U.S. was laying the groundwork for its own overseas empire. Um, uh, but facing pressure, uh, Harry Truman officially opposed the, the formal annexation of the Pacific territories instead uh, opting to make them U.S. administered uh, United Nations Strategic Trust territories, which is de facto uh, colonies, right? So the Federated States of Micronesia, Marshall Islands, and Palau are all states that emerge from the, these trust territories. Uh, the Northern Mariana Islands became a Commonwealth territory of the U.S., and I believe they still are. Um, but like the League of Nations mandates that... Uh, that preceded them, these like trust territories were obviously paternalist, racist, and de facto colonial systems based on the supposed inferiority of these Pacific Islanders. Uh, so the US gained control over these islands, including the right to maintain bases in exchange for under the UN charter, uh, ensuring inhabitants well-being and eventual right to self-determination. TikTok. But uh, so the Navy assumed direct administrative control of the islands post-war and retained that until the Department of Defense took over in 1951. So what the trusteeship was de facto annexation. Um, and the Pacific Islands, like the British Isles, held so many U.S. bases after the war that the areas began to be referred to as the United States' unsinkable aircraft carriers. That says a lot about how we view these different places. It's not about the people that live there or the pristine uh, like natural surroundings. It's, it's a physical aircraft carrier. It's a physical extension of our military um, and, and only you know, matters uh, in that regard. Um, so post-World War II and the Cold War, uh, by the end of World War II, the military was building bases around the world uh, at an average rate of 112 bases a month in over 40 countries. Um, and a single base in Manus or Manus on the Admiralty Islands, a place I've never heard of, and neither of you, don't fucking lie, uh, cost approximately $156 million or around $2.3 billion in today's dollars. Um, and so there were, you know, hundreds of these being built. And this, these bases were made possible through the immense wealth and industrial and logistical capacity of the U.S., but more importantly, uh, they were built on the exploited labor of local populations. Um, in the colonies, uh, the U.S. paid laborers as little as 50, 30, 10 cents a day for their work. Uh, some people worked for food rations. In captured Japanese territories, uh, U.S. soldiers uh, often forced Koreans and Okinawans to work under threat of force, uh, slave labor, uh, in the same manner as the Japanese empire before them did. Uh, and this was common practice. Uh, remember that between 30 to 40,000 enslaved uh, Koreans and Chinese workers were killed by the atomic bombings too. Um, and, oh, I forgot to put a quote in here, but there's a historian, uh, Andrew Friedman, who talks about this system of labor extraction. And he says that French colonial plantation labor sweated for US projects in New Caledonia, the New Hebrides, Dakar, Bizerte, and Agadir. In Dutch Guiana, the Netherlands colonial labor and equipment did the work. In Liberia, Guam, the Philippines, and Hawaii, U.S. colonial labor did the job, including a group of Metlakatla Indians in Alaska. British colonial laborers worked for Americans throughout the system in Trinidad, Jamaica, Barbados, and Bermuda, in Accra, Kano, Khartoum, Cairo, Aden, Karachi, Calcutta, and Assam, and then the Solomon and Gilbert Islands. In Papua New Guinea, Australia's co colonial laborers did the work. So we're, the U.S., in, in the minds of Americans, we were 
not an empire and you would still be hard pressed to get any average American to say that we have an empire, tell you what that even means. But in, in reality, we are not only creating a bigger uh, and more robust empire, we are building it off of the existing frameworks of these European colonists, right? Um, so protests broke out in Okinawa against the land seizures and the US occupations uh, within months of the end of World War II. Um, and in 1956 at the Tachikawa Air Base in the Tokyo suburb of Sonagawa, the Japanese government's announcement that it would be expropriating local land to expand the base on behalf of the US Air Force led to years of large protests featuring uh, battles between protesters and Japanese police in what they called bloody Sonagawa, the suburb. Uh, the protests very nearly upended the US-Japan military relationship and threatened the heart of American military policy in East Asia. Um, and at this time, the US ambassador to Japan openly called Okinawa a colony of 1 million Japanese. Um, later, as the Korean War wrapped up in 1953, Eisenhower greenlighted Operation Big Stick, dispatching 20 nuclear armed B-36 bombers to the Kadena Air Force Base in Okinawa in order to pressure South Korea to sign an armistice, which they had not done yet, um, and it worked. And in 1960, the United States and Japan had concluded the Treaty of Mutual Cooperation and Security, widely known by the Japanese abbreviation AMPO, which allowed continued US occupation of Okinawa and retention of our military bases elsewhere in Japan. Uh, and the opposition to AMPO was so widespread and the protests were so massive that the future, that the government of uh, Prime Minister Nobusuke Kishi, also known as the Monster of Manchuria, also known as Shinzo Abe's grandfather, um, uh, oh, so the government of Kishi had been forced to resign. Um, and Nobusuke Kishi was also the brother of the future prime minister, the following prime minister, um, Sato, uh, which I, I didn't know <laughs> for a while. Um, but he, don't Google Shinzo Abe grandfather, worst mistake of my life, et cetera, et cetera. But Kishi had also blundered by telling the Diet that the Japanese constitution did not ban the development of nuclear weapons, a view that was anathema to most Japanese people. Obviously, Japanese atomic bomb survivors spearheaded the both the non-proliferation treaty and the recent uh, ban on nuclear weapons. But, um, and so MacArthur, as I mentioned, gets in there and he pressured the chief justice of the Japanese Supreme Court to overturn, uh, excuse me, I've lost my place. Da, 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 da. To, oh, excuse me. To He pressured the chief justice of the Japanese Supreme Court to overturn a Tokyo district court ruling that U.S. For forces in Japan represented war potential under their constitution and therefore infringed upon Article 9. Um, and actually, it was MacArthur actually helped write, actually pretty much single-handedly wrote the uh, constitution. Um, I think Alan Dulles was involved in there, too. Um, but Article 9 states that the Japanese people, again, forever renounce war as a sovereign right of the nation. Um, and also during that time, the Japanese government had uh, concluded the first of a series of secret agreements with the U.S. in which the government, uh, the Japanese government supported U.S. military or new U.S. nuclear strategy and military preparations. Um, and the most egregious offense to come out of this was the tacit agreement that no prior consultation was required for U.S. military vessels carrying nuclear weapons to enter Japanese ports or sail in Japanese territorial waters, basically meaning that we could store and transport our nukes freely without notifying the Japanese government in any fashion, which happens happens all of the time. These nukes are not just stationary. They are moving constantly. They're being refabbed and prefabbed and, and moved and, and put in between two fault lines and uh, in, in war zones and stuff. Uh, but yeah, I digress. So that is, uh, Nixon with Nabusuke Kishi, the monster of Manchuria, uh, one of literally a class A war criminal who served time, uh, for three years after the war was ended. Um, I, I don't remember if he was indicted in the Tokyo tribunals or I guess it had to have been, but then that's Kishi on the left with his brother, uh, another future prime minister, uh, Sato and after Kishi got out of prison and uh, he, <laughs> I, I, I won't get into his crimes because they're honestly like very, very disturbing, uh, even to somebody who reads about this shit a lot. But um, Sato was also key 
in Japan's remilitarization. He took office in November 64, just one month after the Chinese atomic bomb test. Um, and he had met with President Johnson in January of 65 and declared that if Chai comms, Chinese communists, had nuclear weapons, the Japanese should also have them. And he added that Japanese public opinion will not permit this at present, uh, but I believe that the public, especially the younger generation, can be educated. Uh, read indoctrinated to to support uh, this like nuclear warmongering. Um, and another future prime minister, Yasuhiro Nakasone, who was at the time the director of the Japanese Defense Agency, commissioned a report by the agency that concluded it would be possible in a legal sense to possess small yield, tactical, purely defensive nuclear weapons without violating the constitution. And that reminds me of uh, people here in the U.S. who say that, you know, sovereign citizens should be able to legally have like tack nukes under the Second Me Amendment. But I digress. So there's this stretching and uh, violating of uh, Japan's supposed like anti-war, anti-military and anti-nuclear uh, legislation during this time. And Sato tried to hoodwink the Japanese people with uh, a speech about his three non-nuclear principles in December of 1967, where according to those principles, Japan would not manufacture, possess, or permit the introduction of nuclear weapons into Japan, uh, a commitment that he was regularly breaking and that he privately told the US ambassador was nonsense, right? It's just, just lying to his people flagrantly. Um, and when Japan signed the UN Non-Proliferation Treaty in 1970, it was signed after we had already promised the United States that we would not interfere with, um, to, or excuse me, that uh, we got a promise, Japan got a promise from the US that it would not interfere with Tokyo's pursuit of independent reprocessing capabilities in its civilian nuclear power program. Essentially saying that if Japan were to find itself uh, a screw turn away, a screwdriver turn away from weapons capable, like some uh, place like Iran did, that we wouldn't interfere, right? It, it's okay to have nukes or nuclear capability and all the nuclear infrastructure as long as you're on our side. Um, so Japan uh, from this point on from 1970 was, and, and still is one screwdriver twist away from having nuclear bombs. Uh, and because of its close alliance with the US who never received the same scrutiny that Iraq and Iran did. Um, so then in 1971, um, the U.S. and Japan signed a treaty that allowed that returned Okinawa, even though it's its own place and its own people, back to Japan. Uh, just another colonial master uh, in May of '72, um, and the sentiment among Japanese and Okinawans was that the bases and the new bases and the old bases were still abhorrent. Um, but according to the new treaty, the, U the U.S. would sell Okinawa back to Japan, but it would retain its bases on the island and use them for combat in the region. Uh, and Japan, the U.S. got a sweet deal out of this because Japan not only paid us an exorbitant sum to buy back Okinawa, it agreed to make large annual rent payments, basically, or not rent payment, but like utilities, like HOA fees on our military bases. Um, and elsewhere, the U.S., uh, we pay host countries to in order to put our bases on their land or, you know, share the cost. It's not often that they're there on invitation and the host country is, is footing the bill, though that does happen. Um, to make matters worse, uh, PM Sato subverted uh, the nuclear agreement by secretly allowing the U.S. to reintroduce nuclear weapons into Okinawa, where they exist to this day. Um, and so... Later, uh, Japanese Prime Minister Yukio Hatoyama learned the hard way that uh, U.S. military presence in Japan could not be challenged uh, when he tried to renegotiate the agreement uh, to relocate the uh, Marine Air Base, um, the Futenma base, to Hinoko. Um, Obama insisted that Japan abide by its commitment uh, despite, despite fierce opposition from uh, native Okinawans. And when Hatoyama caved to US pressure, his government collapsed. Um, and his successor, Nato Khan, Naoto Khan, uh, learned his lesson and uh, learned how to toe the line. In December 2010, Japan announced a shift in military doctrine to de-emphasize the threat from Russia and shift resources to combating China and North Korea, which is in line with US's greater Asian strategy. Um, and Japan's SDF, or Special Defense Forces, which is Japan's army in 
you know, in the absence of like a true standing army um, that would also cooperate much more closely with the US, Australia and South Korea. And the SDF forces, uh, I think have only been deployed for formal combat missions like one time in Japan's history since the end of the war, but they were providing, you know, support to Vietnam, uh, the Iraq, the, the global wars on terror, things like that. So uh, demilitarized uh, on paper leaves a lot of uh, leeway for shit like this to happen. Um, and the new national defense program guidelines called for increasing Japan's submarine fleet from 16 to 22, new fighter jets, uh, cutting the number of tanks to create a more mobile force that could quickly dispatch troops to deal with uh, the South China Sea or in Korea. Um, and in December 2011, Japan announced the purchase of some 40 Lockheed Martin F-35 <laughs> stealth fighter jets. Wow, we're really getting a sweet deal out of this. Uh, between, you know, six and eight billion uh, for that order. Uh, despite, and this was in the wake of uh, the Fukushima, I think Fukushima was 2011. It might've been another earthquake, tsunami, nuclear accident combo. Uh, so Japan's government has been fully complicit in this expansion here, right? In the absence of their, them legally being able to have a standing military, the US acts as that, meanwhile, exacerbating literally every conflict in the region and severely disrupting and, and harming the local populations. So that is why the DSA is putting on this conference. Um, oh, did I finish? Did I actually get through all my notes? Yeah, I did, sorry about that. Um, but yeah, and that's just, I think that's the last one. Oh, so here's just some recommended reading. Um, I think I put the sign up link for the conference and for to and the petition and to contact your local rep. Um, so yeah, that's just what I wanted to talk about today. I